Welcome back to lightning round of Hip Mojo number 16. They gave me some oxygen, I'm ready to go again. All right, so uh, first off, what's everybody's beef with Facebook's new feed? Okay, um, I'm not gonna say anything new or original here. Uh, not that I didn't have these thoughts, but other people wrote them down first. Um, so what Facebook does now is with a lot of people, if you have certain content creator apps such as uh, Wall Street Journal's Social Reader or the Guardian's app, anything you read while you're logged into Facebook automatically gets pushed to your, your feed. Ooh. So you know your feed gets really cluttered, really spammy. Uh, you're sharing stuff that you're not necessarily wanting to share, and I think that's what people are, are peeved about. So so one, there's the privacy issue. Uh, I think it's a mistake for that. You know, I should be able to go and read content without you telling everyone. Um, secondly, uh, you know, sharing should really shouldn't be passive. Sharing should be like th there should be a, an element of intent or volition behind it. You know, I'm sharing this because I actually think it's share worthy. Uh, at this point, you just have content creators through their apps uh, using my personal feed as a spam to say link, link, link. Look at us, look at us. Um, I think this is gonna saturate feeds. It's gonna kind of kill the virality of stuff that could go viral because as much as people would actively share stuff they still like they'll be sharing so much without even realizing it. So I, I think it's kind of killing the whole uh, ethos behind the idea of sharing. And sharing is really, at the end of the day, what any social network's about. I don't think this table would fit Mark Zuckerberg's balls. That's all I have to say about that. All right, next up. All right, um, so Ash, do you think it's fair when CEOs get bonuses after big layoffs? Okay, life's not fair. Uh, I don't think it's right, but I understand why. And for the simple reason that you know, I've looked into this issue, spoken to many experts. The idea is, let's say you're running a, a newspaper company that is going downhill. You need to bring talent to run the company. So if you are going to bring on a super duper CEO and tell him, you know, because we are seeing our business shrink, because we may be losing money and we have to lay off, then you're not getting anything. Why would that guy stick around? He's like, it's already an unpleasant thing to be doing. It's not where I'm gonna get money off equity or make money as a profit. So yeah, in that context, if you want talent, then you should give them a bonus. But that also means expect to get your house egged, expect to get you know booby trapped or whatever. Like you're not gonna be a popular fella, but if you decide to take on that mandate, I understand why then you have to compensate the CEO if you want a talented guy. It's not fair. I mean, it's, who cares, life's not fair. Uh, it might not be right in the eyes of many, but it does make sense. If he's talented and he's worth the bonus. Yeah, and he might not be, but the problem is how many people volunteer to find themselves in that position? So you gotta compensate somehow, you know? Why does the garbage man make more money than, let's say, the guy serving you a burger at McDonald's? Well, if you ever need to let anyone go, I'll take a check to do it for you. <laughs> okay, good stuff. Uh, next question. Netflix is bringing back Arrested Development. I talked about this like in a recent media a post article. Weeks ago. Um, Four days ago, I think. No, no, but no, I no, no, we talked about it on the show oh, yes, a couple yes, yes, weeks yes. ago. Yes. Uh, is this a sign of the future that basically shows that we're pop culture or, or like, you know, cult hits come back on like Hulu, Apple TV, Crapster, you know, Netflix? Or is this a unique thing because whatever, it's Arrested Development? Um, you know, it, it's hard to say. I'm going to say, though, it's not a unique thing. We're probably going to see... Uh, at the end of the day, you know, you don't need a network anymore to distribute your content. Um, in the case of Arrested Development, they're bringing it back. I think we might start seeing a lot more uh, shows developed, you know, for digital, for companies such as Netflix and Hulu, as opposed for, you know, network distribution. Um, as, as, as far as how many cults actually come back or re-enter production, it's hard to say, but I don't think this is a one... Uh, a one-off thing. I think probably how it's adopted and how this practice is used is probably gonna evolve a lot before it becomes stable, but yeah, this is probably the beginning of something big. Yeah, I do think it's interesting that Netflix is, is gonna place a bet on an existing franchise and not necessarily do something from scratch, right. whereas that was the rumor. So I think, again, big media celebrities are always drawn to the web. Is there any retention, any staying power? I don't know. Ashton Kutcher did Catalyst, now that he's making all these millions on Two and a Half Men, how much more online you know, cutesy stuff is he doing? Not much. So I think here, all these guys are gonna be drawn to getting back, getting the gang back, but it's not TV. There's no cachet for them. It's almost like they're playing in the minor leagues. So the money has to be really good, so time will tell. Next up. All right, uh, so Ash, is Wenner's, Wenner Media's strategy uh, really smart or really stupid? Well, just the strategy we're talking about is Wenner Media owns Rolling Stone and many others, and they never really developed Rolling Stone into its potential. So initially what they did is they licensed it for millions of dollars to real networks. 
And then now that they got it back, the, the URL, they're basically putting all the content behind a, a paywall. You know, I think, again, we talked earlier about how music has missed the boat and print has missed the boat. I, I understand the cynicism that, that Jan Wenner has um, around the web and all that because you make real money in print, but it is shrinking. I think that's the one you know, perfect example of it's a private company, millions of dollars that they get as a license, which goes straight to the bottom line. It's hard to knock a guy's decision, right? It's like we, get, we have some deals that don't make sense to outsiders, but they do make sense as a private company, right? So I don't think historically it's been a bad idea, but I think he should probably not tilt his entire company to embrace free ad supported. But I think the depth and the massive catalog that Rolling Stone has, I think that's the one exception where it's a shame that he's not leveraging the web. Because look at what Pitchfork's done, look at what Stereo Gum did, look at what all the sort of new media music brands have done. Watch Mojo, for God's sakes, has all these amazing music videos and these you know, interviews with celebrities and profiles of superstars. We're sort of, you know, when I say we disrupt cable, well, we're also sort of disrupting print in that sense. Why are we allowed to do that? Because he's not embracing the web, right? So in that vacuum, he is definitely leaving some value and money on the table, but I don't blame him for his decision. It was the right decision, financially speaking. I just think the longer he does that, the more he gets left behind. Well, then it's not necessarily the right decision financially because uh, it might not generate any revenue anyways. We'll not get into it too far. So um, why is Microsoft launching a social network? Isn't this game over? Like Google Plus was the last of the Mohicans, but now what, Microsoft's launching something? Well, um, it's actually the second time Microsoft has tried to launch a social network. I think back in like 2006, 2007, they had Wallop. They were yeah, MySpace true. killer. Um, I don't think anyone got, I don't, I don't even know if it ever went public. I think it was always in private beta, which it was super easy to get an invite. Uh, now they have, uh, well, social, uh, S-O-C-L. Um, very Web 2.0. Very Web 2.0, great name. Uh, the thing is, is I don't think they're trying to be the next Facebook. What I think they're trying to be is the next Google Plus. Let me qualify that. Why would you want to be that? Well, okay, someone on TechCrunch wrote a great article that when Google, shortly after Google Plus came out, and it's like, you know, for what everyone can say about whether or not it will work or not work, the fact of the matter is, is we have no idea how Google will work it into its existing suite of products, you know, including Gmail and Android and everything. Um, so to that extent, if this guy was right, I forget who, which, which uh, blogger wrote it, but uh, I can see social being launched to kind of fit into the Windows Phone 7 suite, the same that Google Plus would fit into the Android suite. Uh, that being said, I don't think it's a smart strategy because Android is widely adopted, Windows Phone 7 not so much. Um, I used to have a Windows Phone 7, hated it. Um, so until they can, I don't know, maybe they should be toying around with this, but frankly I think they should just uh, focus on their great partner with Facebook, uh, partnership with Facebook, see how much they can leverage that and just stop throwing money at things that, you know, like the wheel. Okay, before going to email of the week, very quickly, you mentioned Wallop. So back before Watch Mojo started, I emailed the, the people that were running that at Microsoft and I pitched them this concept of a social network. Don't laugh, called Trade Mojo. Uh, this was before Watch Mojo, before Meta Mojo and all that. And the idea of Trade Mojo was it was a social network around IP. So let's say like, you know, I'd written screenplays and I'd written manuscripts and, you know, but I said, imagine if you write songs, but you want to basically commercialize that. So you put it up and then, you know, you have your profile, your songs, your, your articles, your scripts. And then on the other side, you might have like a director or a producer or a filmmaker, or you could be a, a guitarist who's great with melodies, but you're looking for a lyricist. And, you know, I pitched them all this and blah, 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 but they're like, yeah, we're going to go with this guy. He's a superstar and we're going to do wallop. And I was like, so I could be basically, you know, the, the very same things I make fun of, I could be in social networking now and, and running like in... You could also Lord be the Lord. butt out of a lot of jokes. Uh, probably, which is knowing my, my background, that's probably... Actually, which takes us to the email of the week. All right, uh, the email of the week, it's, it's actually anonymous. No one... Uh, we have an email address. It's, it's no because I'll, you'll see why. It's, uh, it's based on the last article I wrote on TechCrunch. Okay, well, is one of the comments you got? Anyways, yeah. I'll get to it. Uh, what is the general feedback to your article from peers in the industry, okay. i.e. other CEOs? Okay, so I get a lot of emails. After, the main reason why I write so much is because when you write on your own blog, nobody really tends to read it. It's relatively small. But when you write on TechCrunch Media Post paid content, a lot of people in the industry read it. So the good thing is when you then meet people at conferences, or especially when you have business meetings, They've read your stuff to some extent. They're like, okay, we know his ideas, whether we agree or disagree. So that's when I can, believe it or not, I can actually shut up and let others talk. And 
get a sense of what they're doing and get a lot more insight and intel from the source and then apply that to articles. So there is a method to the madness. So the feedback I get usually is actually very funny. It, it runs the gamut from great article, this is really good, you know, we should meet up some point. But I'll always get fellow CEOs we work with and I'm not gonna name them. And then the, the guys I know falls into two things. It's either like, what the hell, Ash? I thought we were buddies. I thought, we, you know, why were we not included in this? Um, and occasionally I will get a more sort of like, you know, I disagree with you and, and blah, blah, blah. But I think overall, it's like really when I look back at the last year or two that I've been writing, it's definitely helped our profile. I think it doesn't hurt. But it's just nice to see that uh, people, despite what they say, like, and I'm the same way, by the way, when they're like, oh, press doesn't matter, we just focus. Like when you write an article and let's say you just forget to mention a fellow company, a fellow CEO's company, they'll, they'll call you out and they'll be like, what the hell, you know, like how come you're not adding me? You know, so it's, it's just interesting. Politics. Politics, all right, so I like that, glutton for brevity. I need to look up what that word means, brevity. It's oxymoronic, but I know. Know, let's not get into it. All right, that's been show number 16. We'll catch you next week, same time, same place. Mm -hmm.